Welcome to the second in this series of webinars focusing on rural disputes. My name is Stephanie Hepburn. I'm an associate in a litigation department. With me is my colleague Elaine Brailsford, and together we are part of our team specialising in rural disputes. We're going to look at the practicalities of serving notices that are commonly required in the rural sector, with a particular focus on time and time limits. We I hope to have five minutes at the end of the webinar to answer any questions you might have, so please use the chat facility on your screen there to type in your question and hopefully we can pick up one or two at the end. I will now hand over to Elaine to kick us off. Has anyone experienced that heart-stopping, gut-wrenching moment when you think you haven't served or lodged something on time? I'd like to say I never have, but I'd be lying. However, many, many years ago, when I was first qualified as a newly qualified solicitor, and I won't embarrass myself by saying when that was, I was given a booklet from the Law Society called Ensuring Excellence, Even Better Practice in Practice. And I still have it locked away in my desk drawer so as to prevent it going walkabout. It is my invaluable guide, and the chapter most resorted to is time. Anyone remotely involved in the serving of notices will know the importance of time limits. How long do you have to do something? How do you calculate the time period? When does the period commence? When does it terminate? What do particular time phrases mean? When you have resolved those questions, you need to, um, to think, on whom do I serve this notice? And how? And what happens if there's an error in the notice? We're going to look at each of these in this webinar. But firstly, we're going to look at the calculation of time. It will always be a matter of construction of the words in question, but there are some common phrases that have been judicially determined. It's essential to establish precisely at what point the period you are talking about commences and when it terminates. So we're going to use a worked example, assuming the relevant date is Monday the 10th of December 2018. So quite often, a uh, lease will stipulate something has to be done after a certain date, so after the 10th of December. In that situation, the 10th of December is disregarded and the time runs from the beginning of the following day. So time runs in that example from the 11th of December? Yes. And what time on the 11th of December? Is it 9 o'clock? No. After 10th December essentially means from midnight, the point when the 10th becomes the 11th. At least, that's often uh, seen in leases, at least 14 days, that means 14 clear days. So say you want to terminate a lease at the termination date and you have to give notice of at least a certain number of days. For example, you may have to give 40 days notice under the Sheriff Court of Scotland at 1907, which applies to leases of land less than two acres. How do you calculate that? Well, let's take 14 days rather than 40 for the purposes of my calendar example, uh, because it's the same principle. Both the first and last days of the period are to be excluded. The recipient has to get at least 14 clear notices in, in our calendar example or in your um, section 37 example, 40 clear days notice. In the calendar, it can be seen on the screen. So to calculate your 14 days, you work back from the stipulated termination date, in this case the 10th of December. Disregard the 10th and allow for 14 clear days back from that and that takes you to the 25th of November. So you need to serve to ensure it arrives in their hands by the 25th of, of November. Hang on, that's a Sunday. Also, your period there, the 14-day period on the, on the slide there, that includes a couple of weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. Are these included? How do you serve on a Sunday? That's quite difficult, is it not? Well, when calculating time, Saturdays and Sundays are not normally excluded. So it's quite competent in this example to include the 1st and the 2nd of December in the calculation of the 14-day period. And whilst it's legally competent to serve on the 25th, which is a Sunday, there may be statutes that prohibit that. 
but there are also practical difficulties, as you've suggested, Stephanie, in doing so. There's no post for one thing. So on the basis of the 24th of the Saturday, and a notice by post could be received on a Saturday morning because you can get post on a Saturday morning, would your advice be that the latest possible date it should arrive in the recipient's hand is Saturday 24th then? Yes. So am I safe to send that recorded delivery on Friday 23rd so it arrives on the morning of Saturday 24th? Well, not really. If your experience of the postal service is anything like mine, it may not arrive the following day. In fact, if it's addressed to a business address, it probably will not be delivered until the Monday. Even if I send it on Thursday 22nd, it might still not arrive by the 24th. True. A notice requires to be received to be effective, and there are a number of points here. A contractor lease may have a deeming provision. For example, any notice shall be sufficiently served to sent by recorded delivery to the recipient and shall be deemed to have been given two working days after the time of dispatch. It shall be sufficient proof of proper service that the envelope containing the notice was duly addressed to the tenants or the landlords, as the case may be, in accordance with this clause and posted to the place to which it was so addressed. If you're serving under a statute, that too may have a deeming provision. But if there's no deeming provision, or you can't rely on any deeming provision because, say, you've not sent it by recorded delivery, the onus is on the sender to prove that the notice was posted and delivered. There's case law that indicates that where a letter to a particular addressee had been posted, then a presumption arises that it was delivered. But it's a rebuttable presumption. The evidence may show that it was not received. So if the lease identifies how sufficient service is to be affected, is the common law presumption as to receipt displaced? What I mean is, if the relevant date you require to have served by is actually 24 hours after you post, but the deeming provision says service is deemed to have been served or affected 48 hours after service, might you be too late in that case? No, the common law presumption as to receipt may still be utilised. Deemed service can be achieved by complying with the provision, otherwise proof of receipt is required. So you can prove it was received within 24 hours and you don't need to rely on the deeming provision. And it's not in every contact, contract or lease though that there'll be a deeming provision and it's not an implied term. So always check the contractual or statutory provisions you're serving notice under. And if they are silent, the common law position will apply. What if the requirement is to give not less than one year nor more than two years notice before the date of termination, which is the requirement for certain notices under the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act in 1991? Well, the same applies. The phrase not less than is synonymous with clear days and the first and last day is excluded. At, moving on to at, that means precisely that, at that day or that particular time. So if something requires to be in our hands or delivered by 11 a.m., 11 one would be too late? Well, if it requires to be in our hands at 11, then 11 one would be too late. But you might have an argument that time is not of the essence, uh, and that would require the contract to be construed as a whole. Now looking at by, by a specified date, this refers to the whole of the day in question, not merely that portion during which business can be transacted. So a notice is to be served by the 10th December. This would give you until midnight on 10th December. Yes, however, in reality, what you tend to see in contractual provisions is by 5 p.m. on 10th December. So in that case, midnight would be too late. But remember, it will be a question of construction of the contract and the provision in question. Also, if the nature of the act can only be done during a restricted period, lodging a document at public office, say, you know, lodging something at the land court, then the opening hours of that office are relevant. And uh, if you push it through the letterbox at dead of night, it will be held to have been delivered the following day. What about from or commencing from? Well, that is quite tricky. Um, 
It can be ambiguous. It may mean from the beginning, so as to include that day, or it could mean from the termination of that day, so as to exclude it. Very much depends on the context. So, for example, where the words commencing from were qualified by the words at which date, it was held to include the whole of the date. But generally, the date from which something is to incur does not include the date itself. And on, what does on mean? Where something should occur on a day, i.e. on the 10th of December, it may occur at any time within the 24-hour period that is the 10th of December. And within? If notice must be given within 14 days, that means that the time starts to run at the start of the time after the terminus a quo, nice little Latin term there for you, that just means the starting date, to the midnight on the 14th day. So if I must remove within 14 days of the stipulated date of 26th of November, when do I actually have to remove by? Well, looking at our calendar, you exclude the terminus a quo, that's the start date, that's the date you receive the notice. You have until the end of the 14th day after that, so you must remove my midnight on the 10th. Okay, so now you can give us a few words about years, quarters, months, etc. Well, for all practical and legal purposes, the duration of a year is 365 days and 366 days in leap year. We all know that. Even my three-year-old son knows that, doesn't he? Well, I'm sure he does, but does he know that a year is the period of time taken by the Earth to complete one revolution of the sun? I'm sure he doesn't. <laughs> Seriously, whether the expression year refers to a calendar year, January to December, or to a period of 365 or 366 days commencing on an arbitrary date, 10th December, say, to the 9th of December, will depend on the facts of each case. We normally come upon it when a lease continues from year to year by tacit relocation. And then we get to quarter dates, March and Mass, etc. Well, you probably know that a quarter is a period of approximately three months and it elapses between two quarter days. In Scotland, the traditional quarter dates were at Candle Mass, which was the 2nd of February, Whit Sunday, 15th of May, Lammas, which was the 1st of August, and Martinus, which was the 11th of November. But these were all changed by the term and quarter days, Scotland Act 1990, which provided that the quarter days are now all the 28th of the month, so it's Candlemas is the 28th of February, Whit Sunday 28th May, Lammas 28th August, Martinmas 28th November. But there must surely still be a lot of leases out there that are still in existence which refer to these traditional dates, so what applies? Does one govern the other? Does one trump well, the other? Yeah, originally there was a bit of doubt about that, but there was a case in uh, 1992, Provincial Insurance PLC v Valtos, uh, and in that case, um, Martimus was specified in one part of the lease as being the 11th of November, so that was the traditional date, but it wasn't specified in another part. And the court found that in the absence of any clear indication that a different meaning was intended, it must be assumed the same meaning was intended, and it should not be determined by the uh, Term and Quarter Days Act. The correct date was thus the 11th, as that was what was stipulated in the lease. Notably, quarter dates are different in England. And a month? What does a lease running month to month actually mean? Well, a month is a period of between 28 and 31 days. Uh, a month may therefore be one of the 12 named divisions of the year, January, February, March, so on. A calendar month where circumstances make clear that the reference is not to one of the named divisions is a period of between 28 and 31 days, commencing on any day other than the first day of the month, because if it was the first day of the month, it would be a division, um, and continuing to the, uh, six, the day immediately preceding in the next succeeding month. So if a lease commences on 10th December and month to month thereafter, this would run from 10th December to midnight on 9th January? Yes, there was a case about this, Morrison's Executors against Rendell in 1988, 
Um, here, a notice to quit uh, specified the 28th of February 1987 as the date of termination of a yearly lease from 1st March. And the court held that the notice was valid as um, it began at the year, the lease began at the beginning of the 1st of March and it ended at midnight on the 28th of February. Okay, so what about the provision in the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 1991 where a tenant can serve a counter notice within one month after a notice to quit has been served on him and the landlord can apply to the land court to have the notice to quit approved within one month after service of the counter notice? Say, for example, the counter notice is served by the landlord and it's received by the tenant on 10th of December. When is the last date by which the land court can apply to the land the landlord sorry can apply to the land court to have the notice to quit approved because I guess you can't miss that date. Well you have a very interesting combination here of within, after and month. There's no reference to one of the named divisions, so one might assume you need to look at month as being the period which runs from a specified date to the next uh, period, which would be in this case midnight on the 9th of January. But the inclusion of the words within and after, as we've discussed, means that the first day, the date of receipt, is to be excluded, and that would mean your month starts on the 11th and runs to the 10th of January, i.e. midnight, except that, of course, your lodging... Oh, is, oh, yes, the <laughs> land court, so really it means 4 p.m. on the 10th of January. So what you're really saying, Elaine, is take legal advice at the outset if there's any complications like this that might arise to ensure the landlord absolutely doesn't miss that date. Yes. Let, let the solicitor be the one who has to wrap the towel around the head for this one. Okay, so moving on, what about a week? When does a week start? Well, we all know that a week is a period of seven days, but uh, you may be surprised to know that at common law it commences at midnight on Saturday and terminates at midnight on the next following Saturday. So Sunday is the first day of the week. But of course, statute or trade custom may in a particular context dictate otherwise. So for the business week, it effectively starts on Monday. And we always talk about week commencing on a Monday. And everyone's still with us. What about a day? What's a day? Well, a day is a period of 24 hours. At common law, it begins at midnight and it's termed a natural day. Statutes may provide that when calculating a period numbered in days, certain intervening days, such as Sundays and holidays, are to be excluded. And we touched on this when discussing service. So what you've done there, Elaine, is look at how you would generally compute time, but it's really important, I mean, talk about this for days, we've only just really touched on the surface of this topic, but it must be remembered that our general rules and certain statutes may have their own interpretations that must be borne in mind as well. More likely than not, statutes like the Agricultural Holdings Act will use words like not less than, not later than, within one month after service, we mentioned that one, and in those cases to interpret the legislation, you might need to refer back to the general rules of competition that Elaine has, has set out. Yes. So once you've got your head around the, the time period that's going into your notice, um, I think you have to consider on whom you're going to serve your notice and how critical is it to get the parties right in that regard. Well, the case in the Court of Session in 2016, Balgray Limited against William Hodgson. And in that case, the Appeal Division of the Court of Session examined certain notification requirements under the Agricultural Holdings Scotland at 2003, in particular on whom the particular requirements must be served and where. And the crux of this case was that in serving the notice under the Act on Balgray Limited, Mr. Hodgson's, Hodgson's agents actually served it not on the company, not on Balgray, but rather on Mr. Patterson, who was both the director and company secretary of Balgray. And the validity and effect of the notice was challenged by Balgray in the Scottish Land Court. The Land Court held the notice had been validly served, 
That was principally on the basis that Mr Patterson was the controlling, directing mind and will of Balgray, and he actually admitted receiving the notice and understanding its contents. So it followed, in the land court's opinion, that Balgray had been given the required notice in time, and Balgray then challenged this in the court of session. Gordon Sutton concluded that the fact was the notice in the present case was not addressed to the landlord. It wasn't addressed to Balgray, which is, which is what the Act requires. Therefore, it was not given to, to the landlord, and therefore it wasn't a valid notice. Mm, quite critical then. Yes. Yeah. Mm. What happens if there is a mistake made in serving the notice? And that's the actual service as opposed to a mistake in the notice. Well, the case of HOE International against Anderson is a, an interesting case, not least because we acted in it and also because Stephanie thinks it's wrong. It is wrong. This is a case where the contract required notice to be sent to seller solicitors at a specified address and marked for the attention of a specified person. And it was to be personally delivered or sent by first class post or recorded delivery. So actually quite a range of, of methods of post there. However, the notice was sent to the DX which, as you probably know, is a document exchange used by solicitors. And it was not marked to the attention of the specified person either. Incidentally, it wouldn't have done them much good if they had because that person no longer worked there. At first instance, the judge held that the party who had served the notice had failed to use the right key and, and accordingly, the lock will not turn. But on appeal, the appeal court held that in the circumstances of the case, the notice was valid. The appeal court said that it was important to focus on the core obligation or requirement that is at issue, concentrating on what really matters rather than being preoccupied with a morass of detail that is of at the most peripheral importance to the critical question. They said that the more drastic the consequences of the notice, the greater the need for strict compliance. What was important was that the notice arrived in the hands of someone who had the authority to act on behalf of the recipient. Provided that is the case, other requirements may not be important, especially if they are essentially of a formal nature. As Elaine said, I don't particularly agree with that decision, um, not least because we lost. But I think it does give some comfort to those of us who might make a mistake in the service of a notice. But obviously the best thing to do is, is avoidance, so let's not be there in the first, the first place. So get it right the first time. Yep. And what about errors in the notice itself as opposed to just how you serve it? Well, as a basic rule that any requirements for the service notices, whether contractual or statutory, must be strictly complied with. But to mitigate against the harshness of this rule, the House of Lords, uh, as, as they then were, developed a principle called the Manai Principle, under which, in certain circumstances, defects in notice will not invalidate that, that notice. And the Manai principle is really just a, a reasonable recipient test. Minor defects in unilateral contractual notices will not necessarily invalidate that notice if the reasonable recipient, with knowledge of the factual and, and contextual background, wouldn't be perplexed, and that was the word the court used, perplexed by the error. And the famous quote um, for the Manai case is on, on the slide there. If the clause had said the notice had to be on blue paper, it would have been no good serving it on pink paper. However clear it might have been, the tenant wanted to terminate the lease. And the message really is comply with the lease. Check what the lease says. If it says serve it on blue paper, serve it on blue paper. Don't use pink paper. But the inner house following HOE might take a different view. Possibly nowadays? Maybe. So, 
we thought it would help just to go over some practical tips following on from that pink blue paper analogy, which is quite interesting. The real message you want to get over is check, check, check again. Check the act, the statute, check your lease, your contract, whatever it is you're serving notice under. Always check what the requirements are and follow these. If it says blue paper, use blue paper. If it says recorded delivery, serve recorded delivery. No matter what HOE says, don't serve at DX, serve at recorded delivery. Leave yourself plenty of time. Diarise things in advance. Check your leases. Put these dates in your diary way before you get near the dates. Don't leave things till the last minute. We quite often get cases from our contacts, referrals from agents and our colleagues saying, oh my God, it's got to be served in two weeks' time. What do we do? And everyone's panicking. Don't, le don't let yourself be in that position. Don't expose yourself to, to that risk. Diarise things well in advance. Use the two pair of eyes or even three pair of eyes uh, mantra. Make sure everything is checked and triple checked. We've got a case at the moment, Elaine and I, where we are serving quite a tricky notice to quit on a tenant and we are adopting a, a three eye mentality whereby it's been checked by three eyes, pairs of eyes before uh, it goes out of the office. Keep copies of your RD slips, um, make sure you don't lose them until everything's been resolved. And once you've served something recorded delivery, check online, go on the post office website and check when it was signed for, print that off and put a copy in your file because that might be your evidence as to when something was received, if there's ever a dispute in the future. Also, track, this track and trace at the yeah. post office, uh -huh. um, quite often we find this particularly the case with court documents we've served. Yeah. For some reason, the post office sends it back sometimes weeks after, yeah. and we've assumed that it's been properly yeah. served. If you do the track and trace, you can usually see if it has in fact been served. Or, or where it is, if it's in a post office somewhere, a holding office or a sorting office. Always err on the side of caution. We've given a lot of examples, and we could have spoken about for days on the examples, but if you're in any doubt or hesitation, seek legal advice firstly, but do it earlier. Don't leave it till the last minute. Don't leave it until the day before to get it out by recorded delivery. It might not arrive there on time. Give yourself plenty of time. And if you are in any, any doubt, seek legal advice or ask Elaine to read you her book she's got. It's an interesting read. I'm not lending it to anyone because they never get it back. Well, I hope that gives you some insight into what is rather a difficult area. Um, it's no wonder these cases are frequently litigated. A lot may ride on getting it right. I mean, Steph and I make our living sorting out such problems, but I'm sure you would rather not be there in the first place. If you have any particular queries, please feel free to email us after this webinar. We're happy to, to look uh, at any particular problems. And if there are areas that we've touched on here that you think um, would merit some more insight, perhaps a further webinar, please do let us know. Although and we've touched on the surface of these. Yeah. There's so much more detail we would have liked to have gone into, but in 25 minutes, half an hour, we just haven't got, haven't got the time. Yep. So our details are there on the slide. Please feel free to contact us, and thank you very much for joining us. A couple of minutes for, for questions. If anyone has any burning issues or something on our desk at the moment they want to to share the, the chat facility, you can type your question in. Um, no, no questions. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have lots of questions after we, we, we sign off, so please do get in touch. We'd be happy to, to have a further chat or come out to you guys and do a presentation or speak to you guys about anything that, that is of interest. Thank you.